something else. Mirror. So hi everyone, uh, welcome to my talk about cross TC replication in Apache Solar beyond just forwarding data. Um, and thank you Varun for the introduction. So the agenda for the day, and so thank you for bearing with us. The agenda for the day is, uh, I'm gonna start off with talking about the basic architecture of Solar Cloud, uh, then move on to talking about the need for disaster recovery. Um, and then, uh, I'm gonna talk about different approaches to achieving cross TC in solar and I'm going to spend most of the time for this talk uh, on that one specific thing. And then wrap it up by talking about what I believe could be the future of uh, of how to achieve cross TC in solar in a manner that's cohesive and works for most people. So um, a very simplified version of a solar architecture diagram uh, is something that looks like this. Uh, you've got shards uh, that have leaders, and followers, and they talk to each other. Um, and they can, they pretty much play the same role uh, other than the fact that every incoming update is routed through the leader who's also responsible for versioning and doing a bunch of other, uh, you know, managerial things uh, as far as uh, handling documents and data is concerned. Um, so like any distributed system, it seems fairly easy to run and manage. Uh, and the shard replicas, they're, they provide scalability and availability. So if one of them goes away, the other one comes in, assumes leadership. Um, also, if, you're, if you need to support more traffic, you can always add more, more replicas there. Um, and uh, so that kind of solves most of the problem for standard use cases. But when it comes to critical systems, um, it's kind of uh, a no-go to just rely on those basic uh, basic things that a, a basic solar cloud setup provides. Because uh, any critical system uh, would need to account for things like hardware failures, natural calamities, and more. Uh, most importantly, and the most common of uh, the reasons as to why things go down, human errors. Um, and there are multiple solutions to solve these problems. Uh, the most common one being backup and restore. Uh, well, it doesn't really do completely, uh, I mean, off the job. Also, when you're backing up and restoring, you need you should be backing it up to a data center that's, uh, that's outside of your primary data center, only because if something were to happen to your data center, you need uh, somewhere to restore your data from. So uh, that comes with a lot of caveats um, in addition to the fact that it um, it doesn't provide everything that you might need from from a solution for that supports a critical system. Um, so there comes cross TC uh, replication, uh, which not only provides um, guarantees around availability, but also provides things like scalability um, and reduced latency. So for example, uh, if you were running a service that was supposed to only cater to North America and you had your data sitting in data centers across the US, all of a sudden you had to provide some sort of support to, <clears throat> or some uh, you were launching the same service, making this data accessible to people in Europe. Uh, you could set up a, a cross DC replicator uh, sort of cluster uh, in a data center in Europe. And that would allow for you to have lower latencies for your users um, who are in Europe. So what, what is cross TC replication? Um, in the most uh, simplest of, simplest of uh, terms, it's nothing but uh, a means to achieve a sort of mirroring effect across data centers for solar clusters. So anything that you uh, that you ingest in data center one should show up in data center two for it to be searched on, retrieved, or whatever. Um, so that's the most uh, that's a basic understanding, the basic need uh, of why you might want uh, CDC uh, cross data center replication. So now uh, we're gonna talk about uh, the different approaches to achieving uh, cross data center replication. The first one, uh, the client-based replication is, um, is something that we started off with uh, within Apple uh, and it kind of predates all other solutions so, because it doesn't really require too much to be built on. It, re it does rely on your users being wise. It does rely on your users taking responsibility. So uh, this, this solution kind of predates everything else that was built to work out of the box. 
or uh, things that were built to support uh, something like this. Um, if you look at what happens in a in a client based uh, data center application, as obvious, it's uh, the responsibility for everything lies on the client in such a case, um, and. Uh, the client is basically responsible for managing external versions. Uh, Solo does provide some form of, not some form of, but a pretty good op optimistic concurrency. Uh, and so uh, as long as you, you're versioning your documents correctly, uh, Solo is going to take care of things for you. But, uh, but the versioning has to come from the client in a setup that relies on the client to provide uh, cross data center replication. Um, it, and not only that, in this case, client will also have to client also ends up managing uh, request failures and retries. So, uh, the challenges in such a system, though, are if you had uh, if you had a client sending data and say it succeeds uh, in the local data center. That's sorry, getting activated. Um, so uh, if you had uh, a client sending data uh, to your data center uh, and it succeeds on one of the data centers but does not succeed on the other data center, um, it's the client's responsibility to make sure that, uh, that that failure is taken care of uh, and the data is synchronized and consistency is checked and uh, users are alerted when uh, when the data doesn't make it through to you know across all the data centers. Not only that, it's um, all the process has to be uh, synchronous uh, to some extent. Uh, the reason being, if the client sends data to data center one, uh, hears back, gets positive back, sends data to data center two, doesn't hear back, um, it's its responsibility to close that loop and either delete that data from data center one or wait until data center two also has that data uh, to positively acknowledge that request. Um, so it kind of makes it rather difficult for the client um, to operate uh, in such a mode. Uh, also, when a, when a data center goes down, so for example, if data center two were to go away due to network outage, weather issues, uh, whatever it might be, uh, the client um, is going to get stuck. And that might require uh, changes uh, in the configuration for the client to make sure that you can go ahead and uh, you, know, you can go ahead and uh, forget those problems and ignore those problems for the client to understand that uh, uh, that it's okay to ignore uh, those failures might require a config change uh, in in such a case. So while while the system looks very simple to begin with, uh, in my opinion, the cost to operate this is uh, is pretty high, uh, especially if you are going to end up using it at any given point in time, and. That, that comes from our experience having asked our users to start off with this because of lack of any other solution uh, a long, long time ago. Uh, and it's kind of still okay if you're doing this uh, by yourself for, for a sort of cluster that you are the user of, but it kind of gets really difficult when you are just a provider of the platform that others use. Because um, as I said in one of my talks, um, I think last year, uh, uh, sorry, uh, said in one of my talks last year, give me a minute, and okay. uh, that uh, when you're running a platform, your users uh, are not your best friends. So they're, uh, they want a great, stable, uh, up and running system. They want their best, the best performance to come out of it, but they're not they're willing to take you down if that means uh, you know a marginal improvement for their use case. So they're not they're not bothered, but they will bother you when it comes to resolving a problem. Um, and so uh, you know, in such a system where you're relying on your client to send in these this data and make sure that it's consistently sent across multiple data centers and cleaned up when there's a need to do so. Um, that problem gets amplified when you're running a platform. Uh, so I, I really feel that in, in platforms, this value kind of goes not, not to zero, but at times to, the, to negative, because you're firefighting and trying to figure out how to now heal and fix uh, these problems that were created by users 
who did not understand the implication of what they were doing. So that brings um, me to the, to the next approach. Uh, so while that was something that I know uh, we at Apple were doing and uh, a few other companies were also doing things that way, uh, a bunch of people in the community realized uh, there was a need for a genuine cross data center replication solution uh, within Solar. And um, and so a, a few folks in the community, uh, Eric Erickson, I guess, uh, primarily, uh, went out and started working on a cross DC uh, replication uh, mechanism that would be supported by Solar out, out of the box. And the way it works uh, is any request that comes in, and uh, remember, most of these requests that I'm looking at are either admin requests that make changes to the state of the system, or their requests that, uh, or their update requests. Anything outside of that does not really need uh, replication. Uh, replication, for example, select queries have no need to be replicated uh, to go anywhere other than the data center that they're uh, they're sent to. Um, and so do uh, collection admin requests that cause no state changes to the cluster itself. So uh, when a request comes in, um, the data centers are working in isolation, but they do have uh, some knowledge about uh, each other. So the shard uh, in this example, uh, the shard one uh, leader is going to not only index things locally and send them uh, to the follower, but is also going to somehow manage to send this data across the pipe uh, so that a cross DC replication happens to the leader of um, the corresponding shard uh, in another data center. Now, if there are more than one of these kinds, uh, this leader is going to ensure that uh, it reaches every other leader uh, that should have this data, uh, this document. So in terms of uh, the code path, uh, the way it really works is uh, the request comes in, and uh, for all of you who are aware of how Solar works, there's something called the update request processor chain, which is nothing but a uh, but a pipeline of sort uh, that works to process if every incoming update. And so on the leader, uh, it comes in, gets processed through the update request processor chain, uh, and then gets dumped into the transaction log. Transaction log in Solar is um, is basically a uh, it's it's a log for, uh, it's a log of all the updates that are coming in, and uh, there is a thread that's running on the side of the leader that uh, called the CDCR replicator thread that tracks uh, uh, what are the replicated data centers, uh, data center clusters, or CDCR clusters, and reads data off this transaction log. And based on uh, some basic configuration around uh, bandwidth utilization uh, and other other things reads data from the transaction log and pushes it out to the leader of the target DC, to the leader on the target DC. Uh, the difference on the target DC being um, it's smart enough to make sure that it doesn't, this data does not, uh, does not come back uh, to uh, the primary DC that originally sent this data. So in that, uh, in our diagram, what we see is that the transaction log basically is acting like a queue because everything that's indexed locally is going into the transaction log, kind of getting buffered there, um, and then being read by uh, by the thread that's responsible to send out all of these updates to everyone who's, who's supposed to be replicating. Um, and we do get an eventually consistent DR cluster uh, that supports both active passive and active active setups, uh, but with a bunch of caveats, especially because the versioning in in solar CDCR solution relies on clocks, and so if you have data centers who have clocks out of sync, uh, that might be that might be kind of complicated or uh, or, or scary. Um, the the best part, in my opinion, here is that it's standalone, which basically means it translates to no external dependency. You don't really need anything else running on the side. You don't need to rely on a third party system. Also, because it's part of Solar, you do get community support uh, from others who are using the exact same solution instead of uh, having their own custom solutions, trying to uh, replicate data from one place to the other. 
So, uh, the re but obviously this comes with the limitations. Uh, one of them being uh, the transaction log, uh, considering it's used as a queue. If your data, if your target data center for some reason goes away, uh, your primary data center is going to accumulate all uh, all the incoming updates in its transaction log without purging them. Only because it can't. That's the only place from where to to replay and replicate uh, stuff to target data centers. Um, and that that certainly might run you out of disk on your primary data center. Uh, the configuration on this one is not easy. For some reason, uh, there's collection level configs and cluster level configs and a bunch of other configs that kind of make it uh, harder to use in my opinion. Um, and then the transaction log approach doesn't really catch up because you're looking at a file-based transaction log that's sitting on the system, um, which, uh, which is okay for small use cases that don't have a ton of data coming in every second. But uh, if the target cluster is gone and you have a ton of data coming in, the transaction log will grow to a size that the, uh, that the CDCR thread is not going to be able to catch up with. So um, it, it's kind of a no-go for any high throughput uh, situation. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, the support for implicit routing is missing, which what that basically means in solar is uh, if you are not using solar's composite ID routers or hash-based router, routers, uh, if you're trying to send data explicitly to a specific shard, uh, that will not get replicated by the CDCR that is uh, that comes out of the box with Solar uh, because that's not supported. Uh, the metrics uh, that CDCR reports also get reset on restart. Uh, a lot of those metrics are okay to be reset, but uh, there are times when you might need historical data, which will go away as soon as your solar instances bounce. And obviously, there's an extra burden on chart leaders because they're responsible for replicating all of this data across to the other data center. Um, so uh, while I spoke about all of that, um, one interesting thing uh, to know is that we never really used a Apple uh, CDCR that was offered by Solar, not because uh, we had concerns. I mean, there were certainly things that we, we were concerned about, but because um, while we we were on, on the first uh, approach to solving CDCR uh, by using client-side replication. Uh, we had already started working on our own internal solution that was closely coupled with uh, with what uh, what we needed. And um, while that happened, uh, the community-based CDCR also was introduced. Uh, but we already had uh, our own version of CDCR. Uh, that we thought was doing the job pretty well and was also addressing a lot of these problems that I just spoke about. So this third and the last part is uh, pretty much that, uh, covering uh, and touching upon those things. So we've been using this for, I think, about four or five years now. And uh, what it provides is it provides an easy way to replicate you know, end ways across end data centers in an active-active manner. Uh, it also allows for or provides uh, retries and error handlings, uh, error, error handling for failed uh, requests across data centers, um, and consistency uh, isn't. It wasn't. Oh, sorry, uh, that's uh, wrong. I mean, consistency in this uh, system is checked. Uh, it's not guaranteed, obviously, because if something happens and you get out of sync. Uh, the, the least that would happen is that you would get to know about a consistency. We have systems in place that would, that would allow us to fix it, but uh, it, it, at the very least, informs us of consistencies when they happen. Um, and insights were missing from the previous rep, uh, cross DC replication, things like latency, consistency, errors and retry counts. Uh, but in this case, uh, we build a system where we get all of those numbers as well. So how does this um, this setup look? Uh, so the uh, this is the basic uh, architecture diagram, uh, basic architecture diagram for uh, what we use. And we use Kafka. Uh, we built a cross DC replication using proprietary queues, but also Kafka. Um, uh, and when a request from the client comes in, 
it comes into the primary or whatever is this targeted uh, solar DC that it comes into. Uh, that is its own local zookeeper and it has its own local queue. Uh, so if you look at uh, the closely coupled orange, yellow and the green boxes, uh, they're together in one, uh, one data center. And then there's a mirror in the middle that mirrors this onto another queue um, and sends this data uh, to be consumed by something called the cross DC consumer, which is a standalone app. And we're going to get to that in a bit. Um, and uh, that runs in isolation again and has no idea about the existence of, uh, of the data center that this request originally came in, uh, came into. So what this gives us is the, the ability to isolate the queue and the mirror from, uh, from all of the stuff that is, uh, that is solar. So um, I see we're running short on time now. Uh, so data flow in, uh, in this cross TC plugin kind of is implemented as an update request processor. Um, when a client sends in a request, uh, it comes in with a doc version uh, and an ID, and the receiving data center accepts it only if uh, the, the received doc version is more than the already existing doc version for that document, if that document exists uh, in the index already. And then, as, uh, and then Solar obviously assigns its own version value, uh, which is used internally by, by Solar. But what this, uh, this update request processor does is it strips off this version field and, uh, and inserts this into the queue, uh, into this, uh, the source queue uh, on, on the source or the originating data center, uh, which is then replicated and copied over to the other, other data center by the mirror in the middle. So uh, the, it's then received by the cross DC consumer uh, and uh, the job of the cross DC consumer is pretty straightforward. It's a very straightforward, simple app. Uh, what it does is, is uh, it reads from the destination queue, which is isolated from the source queue because the mirror just mirrors uh, stuff based on config. Um, and then it reads that data and it tries to send these updates to solar. Uh, now this, those requests could in isolation uh, uh, succeed or fail. Uh, we, uh, over time, learned uh, by, by a lot of error, by making a lot of errors uh, as to what makes sense to be retried and what makes sense to be resubmitted or discarded. Uh, so uh, one of the one of the, these things happen when it, when a request is processed by the cross DC consumer. They either are successful requests or they're failed requests that should not be retried anymore or there are temporary failures that could be fixed. And so these are then resubmitted onto a separate topic. Um, and uh, we submit these with, uh, with a timestamp on when this was last retried, how many times it has been retried so far, um, so that uh, when it comes in again to be re retried, we know how many times has it been retried to limit that at or alert if, if a request has been retried too many times. Uh, without any success. And we, we built uh, some form of an exponential back off algorithm in there to make sure that the same request doesn't get, uh, get retried too often. Uh, and the two kinds of requests that primarily we finally ended up rejecting outrightly are the 409s, which is basically um, something, uh, is a case where Solar would go out and say that uh, based on optimistic concurrency, the, the, uh, the version that you're sending for this document is older than what I already have which means there's no need to send me this update. Uh, I already have a newer version of this document. Or in case of a collection creation command that, that fails because the collection already exists. Because uh, if uh, the way it's set up right now is the primary DC submits these requests into the queue, um, if for some reason it failed or paused and two of these requests were submitted to the primary DC and made it into the queue, they would be received uh, by the receiving DCs. Uh, they should just be rejected because they, they're kind of item potent. They wouldn't cause any damage, but there's no point retrying them. And um, the other uh, good thing here is uh, the NVA replication, uh, which 
kind of makes it easy and isolates uh, everything. So if you look at the solar cluster at the top, the yellow and the red, blo uh, the yellow, red, and green boxes that are around each other are kind of, they work in isolation. So the solar cluster writes to a local source topic. Uh, solar cluster also works along with a cross DC consumer, um, which reads from a destination topic. And then there's a mirror sitting in the middle that's configured to just read off of all source of a source topic and replicate and copy this data onto multiple destination topics. So if you wanted to add another uh, another data center, yes, there's some uh, some effort that would be required to bootstrap these. But once you have your indexes bootstrapped, all you need to do is uh, set up uh, or add a config to the mirror, set up a destination topic, start a cross DC consumer. And you'd have a solar cluster that would now be receiving updates from uh, from other solar clusters. Uh, and also, Mirror is something that's lightweight and is kind of provided by most uh, most queue systems. Um, handling of delete requests is a little different uh, because they're not versioned. Delete by queries are not handled. Uh, they're not supported. Delete by IDs are, however, supported, uh, but it works as a tombstone. Um, and uh, this tombstoning is very different from Lucene tombstones uh, in a sense that uh, the, the document is left there as per, if you were to compare it to a Lucene document, the document is left there active and alive uh, for the for, in terms of Lucene. But in terms of the, the business use case, it's marked as deleted so that none of the requests come back with these documents. The reason why this was done this way was to ensure that any accidental delete request that was sent to, to a primary DC does not blindly delete stuff uh, and replicate that stuff uh, because that would defeat the purpose of having uh, a DR strategy because it wouldn't address that, uh, that human error. So you could go back and undelete these but uh, we generally never need this, uh, which allows us to run path jobs to clean up all of these tombstone documents um, on, on a regular basis. Um, inconsistency detection, uh, which is kind of super critical because if you have a cross DC setup up and running, uh, but you don't know if the data across your data centers is actually replicated well or not. Uh, you, you don't really know whether you can use it. Um, and in case of uh, complicated systems, you, that might lead to, uh, to a situation where you're investing a ton of money into large DR clusters that are sitting with data that is inconsistent and unusable. So you do need an inconsistency de detection mechanism at the very least to make sure that uh, all the money that you've invested in setting up a DR cluster um, is is actually uh, ready to be used or ready to, uh, or it, it's kind of making sense. So um, as I said, detection is the more essential part of it. Healing, not so much because there are multiple ways to heal. You can replicate again. Uh, also, if you're having multiple, having this problem over and over again, uh, that's a bigger problem to look at as to why you're dropping data or why why do you even have this this, this inconsistency. Uh, but otherwise, uh, all you need is a detection mechanism at the very least. Um, and this detection has to happen not on just merely the basis of number of documents, which a lot of people do as a very basic rudimentary approach to um, figuring out if the data across two different DCs is the same or not. But what we do is that we we check on every document, uh, a, long, a document ID and version tuple to make sure that that, that pair exists across all DCs. Um, and the interesting thing in designing a system like this is to, uh, is to account for all the data that is still in flow. So when you look at the state of uh, of a primary data center or a data or a data center X, uh, when you look at another data center that's supposed to be a mirror of this one, uh, there would be data that would have gone uh, from and to between or between these two data centers, causing for a different version of uh, your data snapshot that you'll you'll be looking at. So uh, when you're designing such a system, you need to be aware of uh, of this. Um, and I think we certainly don't have enough time to look at this. 
But the way we solve this problem is by using Merkle tree based implementation. Um, and the way it works is uh, every document. So we have a bunch of seeds. We define how many seeds do we have and we define the number of buckets. Uh, seeds are just randomized. And uh, when we define seeds and buckets is basically a two dimensional array. Uh, the doc every document in a data center is then hashed using each of those seeds and then marked in each of those buckets. So you see one blue cross in each of those rows. Uh, there, that represents, say, doc one, uh, or the bucket that doc one belonged to when they were hashed using seed one, seed two, and seed three. So you get this, uh, this array uh, based on your document, your seed, and your number of buckets. Um, and you do the same exercise in your secondary data center, and you compare these two. Uh, to figure out the difference or the missing data between both of these. And now, the way we look, go back to to look at whether they're consistent or not is not to just rerun this um, after, say, time, say, two minutes. But what we do is we, we, we have a predefined time limit and say, OK, we know the documents that were not visible in the last, in the last run. So what we want to concentrate on now is, did those documents ever show up? If they did show up, are they, are they there with uh, the version uh, that we saw them originally in the primary data center with or with a newer version? Both of these cases are good cases. But if they either did not show up or showed up but had a version that was lower than, uh, than what we saw in the primary data center, that's a red flag. That's when we kind of alert for like, hey, there seems to be an inconsistency. Something, something needs to be done about it. Um, and uh, the good part about that approach also is uh, of using such a system is you have a queue-based system, right? So uh, you can always replay things if you think you missed out on, so uh, on something or you dropped data. It's always possible to go back and replay if all of this data is sitting on a system that you prefer to work with your solar cluster rather than completely relying on just your solar cluster. Um, so to summarize that approach uh, or this approach, uh, there's segregation of responsibility is something that we really wanted to do so that solar is not left with taking care of stuff outside of search. Um, and queuing and mirroring are managed by third-party queues. So what that means is uh, you don't have to really even run it yourself. You could be using and consuming a service that is either provided by someone else uh, it could be it could be a, a publicly provided uh, queuing mechanism, or it could be another team that provides the service to you in your organization. Um, and there's retrying of failed requests in addition to the possibility of just retrying everything but rewinding uh, the head on your queue. Um, and adding another DC is easy because all of these uh, all of these data centers are kind of agnostic of each other. The only person who really knows about uh, the existence of each of those DCs is uh, is either the the consistency checker, which runs in isolation, or the mirror config. Um, and the cross DC consumer, uh, as I said, doesn't use solar resources, so you, you you're not going to run out of the uh, disk space because of transaction log exploding, or uh, the leader being bombarded with a ton of updates will not translate into okay now I'm kind of contending for resources where I want to send this data across a CDC, using CDCR, but at the same time also process them locally and make sure that this data is uh, up and running stable uh, on the primary DC to begin with. Uh, and then you can have more visibility into telemetry metrics if, uh, if you use a queue that is managed by a third party system. So uh, to just wrap it up, the future, uh, the. We intend to have a discussion in the community and talk about converging the solutions so that we have fun single end-to-end -end solution. Um, we didn't get the band, we didn't have the bandwidth to do that so far, but the plan is to do that in the near future if that's something that uh, other folks in the community are interested in. So um, watch it for the Jiras, and if you're interested in in cross DC, DC replication in solar. Uh, Please reach out and participate in the community. Uh, and uh, yeah, any any form of participation. It doesn't have to be just uh, code level participation, but uh, design, 
use, sharing your use cases, challenges that you face is as valuable as anything else, as the code or providing tests. So yeah, participate. Um, that's about it. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, and Shum, thanks for the talk. Uh, there are like a few questions on channel, but essentially mm -hmm. we're gonna take one question out of those and then have the rest, uh, have you answer the rest in the GC breakout room after the talk? So I'm gonna okay. have you like answer it in a short version because it seems like the questions yes. revolve around uh, the Jira pointing to remove CDCR from solar. So if you have like uh -huh. a short answer to why there's a Jira like that and like people have questions around that, uh, we can answer that now and then you can probably uh, I can I can. Yeah, I can uh, try and answer that in as few words as possible for now, and then we can elaborate uh, in an offline discussion. Um, yeah, uh, because of the challenges that I mentioned that uh, we realized that the current CDCR has, it kind of seems like uh, it needs to be either removed or redone. In either case, removed from its uh, uh, from the way it currently stands. Uh, to, to have something that is usable and a practical and set up in a practical environment. So uh, yeah, uh, that's that's a reason why I said uh, the feature of this is for the community to discuss and come up with a solution that converges and actually solves the problem rather than have a feature that exists but comes with so many drawbacks that it makes it impossible to use in, in the real world. 